So Crook County is the is the title of my book, and it's not a pun that I made up. It's actually um, what the people that experience the system actually feel that it's doing to them. So in some ways, Crook County is is their kind of mocking of a system that's lost its legitimacy, where they see the professionals, the prosecutors, the judges, and even sometimes their own public defenders, which they sometimes call public pretenders, as making a mockery of justice and playing kind of a game in and of itself. You know, as a researcher, when I went into the prosecutor's office, um, I was one of only a few people of color. I was certainly light-skinned, and in there, in that, in that environment, to do an ethnography of the court system in Cook County, I had access to, you know, hearing how you know, uh, prosecutors and judges thought about defendants, and they spoke in these enormously racist ways about um, people of color. They used ebonics, they mocked them, mimicked them. And so um, for me, I wanted to really turn the lens and not focus on how people were being treated in the system, but actually think about who's creating the conditions of marginality, who's creating the conditions of abuse, and using our justice system to do it. In Cook County, um, racialized justice was, you know, it was, was something that I observed happening in open court, which is that defendants in some ways were being abused or mistreated based on their racial identity. Um, prosecutors and judges were talking about defendants using ebonics. They had a, a, a racial slur that they called a mope, and it had many of the historical stigmas and racialized tropes associated with, you know, blackness and brownness, the you know, supposed tendency to be criminal or lazy or degenerate. Um, it had a terrible amount of meanings. And so they used this racial slur to, in some ways, talk about defendants and describe them as being unworthy of basic due process rights, basic dignity. Um, and once, you know, the fact that it was kind of a coded word, a coded racial slur, allowed them to get away with an enormous amount of racial abuse, not just to defendants, but also to their families and to, to folks in the, in the public galleries. Um, so, it, you know, this idea of a mope became you know, a rationale um, for denying people uh, their rights in America in, in our criminal courts. You know, the idea that there was this kind of pervasive racialized culture and this, the, this kind of slur of a mope being undeserving allowed for an enormous amount of abuse that you might not see in everyday spaces. And I think what was most um, difficult as a researcher was to just watch this type of abuse in mass. So in particular, there is, um, you know, a defendant who begs, uh, he begs uh, not to die in prison. He contracts um, tuberculosis in the jail after he's HIV positive. The defense attorney is asking, you know, for, um, for some leniency because of his health issues and he is now has a low T cell count and has full-blown AIDS. And so you would think that the judge would in some ways look upon that with some level of sympathy, right? Um, but yet he was mocked for uh, in open court about his, his HIV status and the sheriffs stepped away from him. They um, acted as though he was contaminated. The fact that they would resort to abuse um, made it difficult made it difficult as a researcher to watch these things happen. And so, you know, there is the kind of ethics issue. It's, it's, there's the legal ethics, but I think also when you think about being a researcher, you know, what is the threshold when we're watching all these abuses take place? And certainly I had no power to stop it. Um, the only power I think is just probably documenting it and being able to expose it to other, you know, policymakers, other scholars, and, um, and the general public.